Now, we are going to have a little bit of an agenda. Um, we've had uh, a couple of different things. Uh, we're going to go through the PIM IP, how to configure the PIM IP, actually download a file to the PIM IP, some of the settings for that. We'll also talk about uh, the EKUPV app. Uh, we'll also talk about the EKEEP Pro app, EKEEP Ad Pro app, and uh, Blueprints, which actually to me is the, uh, the really cool part of, of being able to control things. Um, Jason, have you joined us? Okay. I know he's here, but I can't hear him, so this is uh, one of the reasons that... Uh, Wonderful technology. Okay, what uh, what I'm going to do is um, actually pull up um, uh, upstart file we've been working with uh, with all day today, uh, which basically uh, shows us our little um, our little uh, screen or screenshot that we've got going here. Uh, our little demo pad. I'm just firing up the webcam at this point. What we've got is we've got a six button keypad. We have a seven button keypad. We have our living room lights, our outside lights, and our kitchen lights. And over here to the right is the, uh, the star of this at this point. It has to do with the PIM IP. It's basically plugged into an outlet and we have a network cord connected to it that goes back over to, uh, to our router. So um, uh, what we can do here, uh, and I'm trying to get Jason unmuted. He's not muted in any way, shape, or form. Um, you hear me now? Not, hey, we got gotcha. you. Okay. So welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Our system all set up, all configured, and uh, for those that weren't here with us a little bit earlier, when uh, we now have the capability with our PIM IP to actually run um, Upstart remotely, um, one of the things we have to do is uh, under the tools, we go to interface, we choose the PIM IP. If I am on site, I can actually run a discovery uh, to find out what my PIM IP address is because they all ship in DHCP mode. Um, once we do that, we can get into configure the network settings, click on the manually configure network settings, put in the IP address it was assigned or one that you want to assign it to within, um, within the network, put in your subnet mask and your default gateway for your router in that, uh, on that job location. Um, one of the other things uh, that we can end up doing is there is a web interface for this uh, that you can address other settings. Uh, DigiConnect is the, the people who use is, is their interface. It's got a lot of power and a lot of, a lot of different things that can be done. Um, if you're going to be connecting off-site, uh, what you can do is uh, PCS office. Uh, and let's see if I can connect to the office if I've gotten this spelled right. Nope, I didn't get the spelling right. But you need to put in your uh, your port forwarding information. Um, I'm not sure I think it's dot com. And I just connected to our office uh, in the in up in the Northridge. Uh, so I can actually control the system up there. And let's have a little bit of fun here for a moment. And let me open the existing file from up there. And I can now remotely uh, program. OK, yes. 
and my system is running a little bit slower. And it would help if I saved my file on my machine. So let me uh, let me get that. Uh, my house. Uh, it's a different place. Sorry. It's obvious. And I think that's it. But I think you can see here. that we can access a system remotely uh, within the job. And uh, let's just do a uh, status. And I'm not sure if this is even the right file. So I always save stuff at the office on the server. So yep. But I am connected remotely to the office. If I want to connect back here, I'll just come back to my IP address. and. Uh, Connect. That's on my IP there. I'm going to do it here. 192.168.1.5. Now can I go back here in my office? <laughs> all right. It's been a great day of all kinds of stuff. So let's bring back the Jones job. All right, so let's say we go and get all of our um, our devices all programmed, things along that nature. One of the things that we need to end up doing is to uh, actually download or export our PIM, uh, this file, to the PIM IP to use the, uh, the EKS. Um, the default username and password is admin and 1234. And the port we're talking to on it is 80. All of these can be changed uh, within the, the Digi setup, but at this point right now, um, those are the defaults. So the eKeypad app can can get into it and uh, and change. So I'm going to download this file uh, into here real quick. Um, we've now connected to it, and uh, it should be done here in about seven seconds. So. Basically, this whole file has now been downloaded into the PIM IP and is stored. So, uh, depending on um, you know any uh, any different way, you know any app that's out there that comes along can come in and grab this information. Now, um, a variety of different companies are starting to use the PIM IP uh, as the uh, the storage point for a configuration file. Um, Alon is leading that pack. Uh, the Elk system, Elk M1, uh, right now is still, you're still taking the file and you're exporting the file as a standard um, UPE uh, file and importing that into your um, RP software. So the PIM IP really doesn't, uh, doesn't affect the way an Elk works with either the XSP unit and a PIM R and or the PIM E module uh, right now. So um, it really it would be a lot more development and things along manager really not going to gain anything uh, for Elk to go and, and collect the data from uh, from the PIM IP at this point. Um, so uh, it, it's just basically easy to just export the PIM the data to the PIM IP, and uh, at this point, um, that's really kind of what we've got to do on our end. Um, from the, the PCS PulseWorks side, and what I'm going to do is uh, make Jason the um, the uh, the presenter, and he will bring up uh, his screen and actually show you a true uh, app application and how to configure that with the data that we have. And he's actually going to run uh, his system and his devices at, at his home. So Jason, why don't you go ahead and take it away? All right. So you guys will probably see the uh, screen start appearing here in a minute. Um, to start out with, 
you know, you'll see on the screen here, there's a, there's a number of e-keypad applications. Um, Are you today showing we're, your screen? We're, uh, they it should, should be. be. Does it, does it, does it. Okay. Um, can somebody just send me a note saying people, other people can see that? See his screen? You can see it? Great. Thank you, Larry. Good deal. Um, you will find that there, there's a number of e-keypad applications that are out there for different types of functionality. Obviously, we're focusing on the ones that can, today, they can uh, communicate with MIP, which will be the EKUPD, which is specifically designed for that, um, in the EK Pro application, which uh, gives just a little more robust support for, uh, for, 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 for larger integration efforts. Um, so start off here, um, I should go, go ahead and launch the EKUPD application here. Um, and it's going to be a very standard screen that you'll see every time you launch. It's going to come up and just simply tell you, hey, look, there's nothing here that's configured. Um, you need to configure something. Um, just dismiss this. We're going to start out here on the configuration screen. Um, now, just to give you guys a quick overview of kind, of kind of what you're seeing on these screens as we go through the process. Um, the um, uh, right at the very beginning, we have at the very top there, we have the profile manager. Um, now, profile, we won't be covering in very much detail here today. It's more of an advanced configuration. Um, but needless to say, it is there to specifically allow support of more complex setups, maybe a customer that has multiple locations um, or has multiple equipment in one location. And it allows for easier organization of that so that it's simpler for the user. Um, automation systems is where we're going to do most of our work here in a second. Um, but, then, but beneath that, you'll notice there's a whole bunch of other additional features. Login, so allows the secure launching of the application. Um, the, the, you know, ability to control, allow sleep, which allows us to control and the behavior of the keypad while it's running, will automatically allow the mobile device to power off or keep it alive. High contrast GUI settings for people that um, at varying levels of uh, color blindness and make the, uh, the interface a little more, uh, a little easier for them to discern. Um, the installer menu here, I'll actually click into that one for a moment. We have a lot of features that primarily only uh, are controlled by, you know, an installer who's putting the system in for somebody. But it gives you some really kind of advanced settings from being able to put your, your own branding on the application uh, that is displayed to the user while they, when they run the application to locking down customizations or edits to the interfaces, and even locking the end user out of the actual configuration screen itself. Um, you know, for the same exact reasons, you probably don't give them a start to go around reconfiguring their switches. You know, the same concept kind of applies, you know, to uh, e-keypad as well. The like restrictions of remote management allows us to do much more advanced things with giving people partial visibility of uh, of devices on the on the UPB network. Um, a good example of that would be, um, you know, a parent and, and with children, where the parents have control of everything in the house, but the kids can control everything but the master suite, uh, or items in the master suite. Um, and then remote management is exactly that. Um, we can do some very advanced things for installations that require it to give us control over your keypad remotely. Um, for example, we can remotely lock and remotely wipe e keypad. If we've got, a, say, a potentially a customer that maybe is a high-profile customer and a lost device is is, is 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 a more critical critical item, we have some really advanced features that we can add on demand uh, as necessary. Um, back and back out here, configuration backups. I mean, it's exactly what it sounds like is it allows you to, once the initial setup of the keypad is done, do it from simple to complex, we can actually embody that, all of that into one encrypted file that you as the installer can keep to make it easier for the future when the customer upgrades or replaces devices. Um, you know, it's just meant to safeguard and store all of that work that has been done to customize the keypad. And then toward the bottom we have, you know, a few items, you know, support, a lot of tools to kind of aid in the diagnosing of issues and problems uh, that, that, that may appear. Um, 
commands to be able to allow you to quickly get information back to uh, back to us, you know, for diagnostics information. Um, and then rounding out, uh, you know, uh, status information in modules. Um, we'll get to modules that there are, there, um, uh, there are a couple optional things that we can add on to uh, EKUPB, you know, if, if customers grow their accounts over time, you know, but those are things that we can talk about uh, uh, probably out of the scope of, the, of this particular presentation. So let's, let's jump back to configuration to what we're actually here to do, which is set up a PAM IP in the keypad. Uh, so will that always that is always done under device management, uh, specifically automation systems, and we have nothing configured as before, so we want to simply add one, and we want to choose PulseWorks here uh, to get to this this screen full of information. Um, device name is exactly that; it's just a name that's displayed on the GUI, uh, gets us the ability to uh, uh, better organize the information, especially if we have more than one device. Uh, we have a profile. I mentioned profile management uh, earlier. Um, this is where we can go in and actually define which which profile or if you will bucket uh, this device uh, is is in. Uh, we're going to leave this on the on the default for, for this presentation. Um, and then we have we get right to network address. Um, now, as Scott had talked about just a minute ago in the setup of the initial PIM IP. Uh, to be able to go in and find the IP address of the PIM IP, um, and then use that to connect to and upload, um, upload the uh, an export of an upstart application. Um, and one of those tasks is supposed to go in and set a static IP address in the PIM IP. This is going to be a very important activity um, with a with an end user that's going to be connecting to using the keypad to connect and control their network. We need to make sure that that address is not going to change on that PIM IP. So setting a static IP is very important to do. So I'm going to enter in the address here that we have locally. All right. Um, the next one is the uh, control port. Uh, this will default to the value you see here. Um, 21 and 1 is the default. Very little need to actually ever change that. Um, Failover, this is a relatively rarely used uh, option. You may only find the need for it in five, maybe seven percent of installs. But in some scenarios where networking, the, the nature of the computer network at the customer's house uh, requires it, it sometimes requires more complicated setups than you keep had to adapt to those realities. And failover allows us to do that. Uh, this will be one of the things. Uh, a lot of scope for what we're doing today, but um, I'm more than happy to help you guys if you run into it to be able to step this up um, so that we can achieve seamless uh, seamless control for the customer, whether they're at home or away. Um, in the UPB specific setting, you know, alphabetized list, pretty self-explanatory. Uh, repeater level and legacy devices are very kind of advanced configuration settings. Typically, you'll never need to change those. Uh, but we can uh, out of those. And then we get to the last three, config port, config user, config password, which you'll remember are the exact same three values that we entered in um, in upstart when we uploaded the UPV export file. And you're going to find that that is always true. That the values that are used in upstart are the exact same values you'll need in, in the keypad. Uh, these are the defaults that are in upstart, so the default here is the keypad. One thing that I will make of note, um, um, for this particular system, we have changed port 80 um, to another port number. Uh, so we chose 2180. Um, and this is a topic that um, we'll probably you'll see come up again, um, specifically for customers where you need to do remote management. Um, Meaning they want to be able to control their uh, their network when they're not at home. Um, exposing port uh, 2101 through a router uh, so that it's accessible remotely is pretty straightforward because 2101 is not a commonly used port number. However, port 2180, I'm sorry, I should say the default of the on the PIM IP for port 80, port 80 is a very commonly used port. So it is not a 
going to be uncommon for you to find that that needs to be changed to some other number so it does not cause a conflict um, with uh, so it doesn't cause a conflict in the router and that's exactly the scenario that we have here locally the PIM IP port 80 was already in use on the router so we had to move the PIM IP over to another port now because of this when I do my upload into upstart upstart uh, for the export file I have to change upstart as well to 2180 you know because it will always end up being their match yeah, um, and Jason just, 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 just to make sure everybody understands is that we're in upstart the default we set is 80, but you can change that port in Upstart when you're getting ready to uh, export down to the PIM IP. Correct. That's correct. And obviously, we're here to support and help uh, anytime. Uh, if you have any questions about this or run into any issues, it's not terribly complicated. But you know, the first time you run across it, I'm sure you know there'll always be a question. So what we're going to do here is we're going to dismiss the keyboard. And we'll be able to go in and actually save these settings. We're initially going to get this validating screen that appeared for a brief second here in the center of the screen before it went away. And what that screen was telling us is it was EPAD was actually connecting to the PIM IP. It was, um, and it actually then turned around and downloaded the export file. And if it had run into any issues, it would have popped up. What we try to make is a, is a, an error message that would have told you what was wrong, why it did not. Uh, wasn't able to connect. It give you the option to go back and you know, make some changes um, before you attempt to, to complete that save. Um, but because that message went away without giving us any uh, reporting any issues, we've gone back to this, and now you'll notice that there's a my UPB that's listed here. Nothing else has changed yet because we're still into the configuration screen. But if we simply touch the uh, gears down in the bottom left here, um, what well, we right. do. The keypad takes all that information, and now it has information that we can go in and repopulate uh, all of the, all of the information that it has extracted from the, the uh, from the upstart export file. Um, actually, we have devices and scenes here. You know, this is very much mirrors. Um, sorry about that. We um, on the devices here, it mirrors all of the rooms that were defined uh, in upstart. And if we click on any of these, any of these, any of these given rooms, it will show us the list of devices that are in those rooms, um, along with the status um, status of the devices. As you can see, the desk keypad is, is currently open. Um, if we click on one, I'll go ahead and use this as test demo here. Um, we get a little bit more information about this, um, uh, telling us about it. We have uh, our device customizations section, and every individual device, every individual scene has a section like this, which gives us a little bit more customizations on on this particular device within uh, within eKeypad. So, for example, uh, management of alerts. This um, this actually allows us to go in and actually define triggers so that we can take actions based off of the status of this this device, this dimmer changing. So we can actually come in and we, we can actually just use we'll use the on. So if this light is turned on, then we can choose from a list of actions. We have a whole number of uh, sounds that we can uh, that we can play here. We can um, even uh, pop up a message, a physical message onto the screen, or even speak a phrase. Um, we'll choose speak a phrase here. Um, and this is going to be doing exactly what it sounds like. Um, the light is on. And so what will actually happen when you keep having to actually monitor for this light while it's running, and if it actually sees that light turn on, it will actually uh, speak the word, the light is on. Um, we can even set this up to actually repeat on a, on a sequence. So if, as long as that light is on, every, let's say, 15 seconds, it will say, tell us that that light is on. Um, the, um, and th th these alerts like this will become really apparent as we talk about the blueprint module, uh, where we will take, you know, typically have 
a copy of the keypad running uh, continuously uh, uh, on you know for the customer. Um, for um, under device back to device customization, we have names. You know, this one was actually had a, a very unfortunate name, Tep LM1 Dimmer. <laughs> exactly that. It's a model LM1 dimmer, and it's one of our test devices. But that's not a very useful name for us to have in the application, but maybe it was useful for us as the installers to name it that and not start. So we can actually come in here to the name. We can give it something a little better. So we'll actually go in here and call this the office, the office lamp. So now that we've actually done this, uh, and name this the office lamp, now anywhere we need to be packed that this device is visible, it will actually use the word office lamp as the description rather than test LM1 dimmer that we have up here. Um, and then finally for secure access, you know, very much dependent upon the nature of the install, um, but we have the option of actually securing access to individual, the control of individual devices. Um, so we can actually go in here and turn this on. We will actually be presented with a screen here that allows us to actually go in and define a code with even an optional hint if we want to. And now the actual control of this dimmer is now actually been secured. So we have to type in a code to be able to control this line. Now, speaking of control, since this is a dimmer, you notice there's a whole set of different control types. You know, and these become very specific to the details of how this this switch was implemented and how it's actually used by the user. Um, so that you know, what then that's when you see sometimes you see duplicates. You know, be it a slide dimmer here that just slides left and right to set dim level, or um, the one beneath it here uh, where oh, I got ahead of myself, <laughs> um, or we actually do. Um, a dimmer where we can actually choose a percentage level um, uh, for it, or actually dim it in 10% levels. It all comes down to how the user wants to use it. But we give that option so that uh, the control kind of matches the way they would prefer. And then a little bit farther down, what we actually have here is we have uh, device favorites. And that, that coincides with the list we see on the left, which is our favorites list. Uh, a little quick segue into the favorites. What favorites are designed for is to give us quick act for two purposes. One, to give us quick access to items that are used for uh, frequent by the user. Um, key items that maybe the user they were very important to the user that they have uh, and they just want to be able to access very quickly without having to, to move down multiple menu items to control. Uh, but it also allows us to change that the way information is organized for the user. You know, organizing switches by rooms may make sense. It definitely makes sense for, you know, for a, you know, like the installer, it makes sense. Um, but does it make sense for the customer? Maybe it does, but if it doesn't, we have the ability in favorites to reorganize that information into a, an organization that makes a little bit more sense. And we're going to do that here, um, here, uh, and showing a good, a good example of that. Um, but to, just to show you how easy this is, you know, at the bottom of this list is the list of all those different control types. By simply tapping on these different types of um, these different types of controls, you can see how those controls just automatically showed up on the on the favorite screen. Uh, flip around my screen here. Um, so the um, And so if I actually reach up and try and control one of these, um, we'll actually see an example of the passcode that we entered a minute ago, where as soon as we try to control it, it's not wanting us to type in this passcode. If we actually cancel out of this, no, no action is actually going to be taken, even though we press, I, I have pressed on the on button. But if I actually type in the correct code, then this will actually dissipate and actually sent the on command. And those of y'all paying attention, the little blue light above um, came on and has actually stayed there. Um, 
let me show you maybe a, a, a better example of favorites and how we can uh, go about uh, uh, doing the customizations on those. So let me, uh, let me relaunch the UVB here. Um, what I have implemented on this system, this is definitely my system, um, is I use a series of relay outputs um, to be able, and, and a power switch, to be able to control, do some basic control of the TV. Um, so outside here, uh, we go to our, our yard and our devices, I actually have an outdoor TV. And so I'm going to actually add over here the control for that TV. And then down here under scenes, we actually have a couple scenes that allow us to do a couple, um, a couple things here. Um, so we activate control, and then we have a, a watch for some news site here. And so what you see is now on the favor on the room favorites, we have an outdoor TV with an on-off switch. Allows us, you know, it's a it's a um, appliance module allows us to control the power of the TV out there. Then we have a couple scenes that allow that actually are controlling relay output. They can send the IR commands to change the specific channels uh, that we have um, set up. Uh, through our uh, I, IR emitters. Um, now, unfortunately, outdoor TV, may, you know, maybe that's not the best language to be using. And technically, that's what that switch is. But in the context of this interface, it's not what we want. So we can go back up here to the outdoor TV, and we're going to actually just call it watch TV. And you'll notice as soon as we did that, now over on the favorite screen, it actually just says watch TV instead of outdoor TV. And, and maybe the same thing for here. You know, we, we really don't like watching Fox anymore. And so we actually changed that um, to actually be just CNN. So we can, without, without necessarily even having to go back to Buzzstar, just change the label on top of this thing, we can go back and type something that's much more representative. So we do that, and again, we, we get this change that happens immediately. Um, now, the favorite screen isn't really organized very well anymore. Um, so we have a lot of options for things. We've had to allow that to be customized. So we can actually go to the edit button at the top of the favorite screen up here. And when we type in the edit, you notice a lot of changes <laughs> happen here. But this gives us the ability to, to customize the way this is organized. So one thing. We don't. We want all the TV-related stuff to be all grouped together. So we can actually grab this TV item, move it down, and add it in. And you can reorder the items that are in there. Equally so, we don't really want to call it scene. You know, so we can actually go in here and do a rename. And now we can actually give this something that means makes more more sense. So we'll just call this uh, video control. For that matter, uh, we're going to change the lights as well, but we'll just call this off. Matter of fact, you know what? We don't even need a label. It's pretty self-explanatory with office lamp. So we'll just actually leave this completely with no section name at all. Do a rename. Now, now we have a completely different, completely changed favorite screen. And you can remember this layout and put it back every time we exit. You come back into the application, it will reapply these changes. And so now we actually have what is uh, an appliance module for the TV and two scenes grouped together into a logical association that that isn't embodied um, in the way that we have our upstart file configured. But yet, you know, by using the keypad, we now have those options to be able to. Uh, to, to tweak that interface, this use, the interface the customer is using, so that it mirrors the way in which they would want to control. So Jason, I got a question here. Um, sure. Being that we're, we're mainly talking about lighting, watching TV, I understand we're turning the appliance module on and off, but how are you actually activating IR 
uh, commands. That's a much deeper conversation. <laughs> okay. okay so of, thank, thank you. Thank honesty. you for confusing us, eh? <laughs> yeah. In all honesty, it's a MXC 400 URC IR emitter, um, and it has two relay, relay inputs that are simply tied relay control. Okay. All right. So let's, 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 let's keep it to let's keep it to lighting for right now. We'll get into an advanced course and things like that of what we can do with each yep. keypad and, and UPD and all kinds of neat stuff. Yeah, definitely. But the point is it, that I was really trying to get to with that example is that the favorite screen allows you to um, think outside of rooms and, you know, into functional groupings of devices and things so that um, so that you can better group the mobile interface to what the customer preferences are. So one of the things you could do is you could have a section that just shows the status of everything, and then you could have another section that would give you the control of devices by themselves, and then a third section that is just scenes. That's correct. That's correct. You know, it, you know, it's we're, we're as in, Having used Upstar, or once you've used Upstar for a while, it's very easy to get comfortable with the concept of organizing items by room. But and while that organization may work great for the customer, it may not. And if it doesn't, you have those options um, to bring out there. Okay, um, bring to the interface. Um, now the for the. Um, in addition to the the iPad, obviously all of this um, is available on the uh, iPhones themselves. Uh, right back to screens that we see, you will see the exact same screens on the iPhone. The only difference is the is the way that they're laid out. You know, obviously you won't be able to see all of the screens at one time on the phone. You'll be switching between favorites and devices and scenes. Uh, as we go through the go through the phone. Um, now, what we want to go talk about now is the blueprint module. And to do that, we're going to jump out of here, and we have to actually jump into a uh, to actually jump into a different application here. Now, and just so everybody understood, just so everybody understands, the blueprint module is an, an additional module that can be yes. added to the EK, uh, EKUPB or EK Pro. Um, and basically the, the, the bigger difference with EK, between EK, EKUPB, it just controls your lights and your scenes. And it gives you the favorites. E Pro gives you the capability of having video IP cameras um, that uh, you can access. And uh, maybe you could explain a couple of the other feature sets that are in EK Pro. But Blueprint is, is to me, kind of one of the things that if, if somebody really wants to think that they're a, a super high-end system um, for a nominal cost is really the way we can we can go with that. Yeah, yeah. Now, I, I was going to get to EK Pro here a little bit later. But yeah, EK Pro expands functionality to control not just the PIM IP, but um, alarm and automation systems like the Elk M1, um, which which has thermostat direct thermostat control, it has additional relays, it has the alarm system functionality. Um, uh, you know, we could reach out and do security for IP cameras or DVRs and NVRs, and is really designed for these more more comprehensive integrations where all of that from all of that information there's a need to control all of it from a single location and EPAD brings that information together uh, with one common interface so that for the customer there's a single point of control right even though all of these different components have come from different manufacturers and you know and as integrators we can just make them all look and work together um, but for the customer they want to be able to actually control them together and the keypad provides that, that, that consistent use, single interface for doing that. But it is 
possible to actually to just do um, just to do EKUPB with a blueprint module. You know, I'll put a walk through an example of doing that just now. So the big difference with the blueprint module, it is for uh, landscape-based applications. And you'll notice we just jumped right into something. Surprise, I thought I had removed this, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> I'm going to hold my finger down on the screen for a few seconds. And we're going to get into an interface here. Now, what had already been done here um, kind of got me ahead here. Is I already have a copy of our favorite screen. You'll notice that before I twisted it, it was empty. Uh, I'm going to jump into a different application. That's why it's empty here. Um, I'll go ahead and just leave it here because um, as we as we go through the process here, we're, we're going to add a few things back to this favorite screen. So I'm just going to move, make it a little bit larger and put it off to the side here. Um, you know, so we got a little small background here. It kind of looks a little bit out of place. I'm simply going to go into the, and this is going right into the photo album of the phone cell. And I'm going to pick an image. In fact, I will delete this favorite screen so we can see what we're doing here. I'll add it back later. So you can see we have a floor plan of a house. You know, um, get this from the customer. Um, there's services out there that can, you know, or, or you can, or you may have a capability in a house to create these. But we have this uh, this representative floor plan. Um, and what we can actually do, we can go back in. Uh, over here, it's under the uh, icons list. And guess what? We set our devices and our scenes. So we can go right back to the office, right back to this dimmer, uh, this test dimmer that we were talking about before. And now, in addition to the favorite screen, where we had before, we put status and on-off control. So I'll add those same back to the favorite screen. But now we have a new section that wasn't there before, and that's the blueprint section. And so what we can actually go in here and do is we can add, we're going to add a dimmer control that light. And you can kind of see the little light bulb that appears here behind us here. And let's go on over here to the scenes and we'll actually call this our um, our front sconce lights. And um, we only really have an on-off control here for that. And we're going to add one of those as well. So we'll remove our icons list and what we actually have here, um, I had a I apologize, I added it to the wrong thing. Well, I'll just go, go to our ceiling fan in our living room here and add an on-off control. So we see we have our two sets of icons here. Ah, there it is. And our front sconces. So what we can do with these icons now, we'll start with the ceiling fan in the living room. It gives us a default, uh, a default light bulb. Um, by default, these little red boxes are showing us what are the touch areas on the screen. So when we're not in editing mode, when we're controlling the um, uh, controlling the, the devices through the blueprint screen, this red box will define the area in which you touch to be able to register a touch for this item. By tapping it once, we get a little bit of a, uh, a little bit of a little halo that appears around it. That allows us to use a single finger to move it around. We can use two fingers to make it bigger. And we can use two fingers to turn it if necessary. And the reason for the halo is if you start getting something down really tiny, it becomes really hard to grab it if you didn't have these little circles. These little circles are what allow us to grab control of it. While we're selected, we can double tap it. And we get a little box that pops up. It gives us some controls over how it's displayed. In addition to the customized names that we had um, before we looked at before in the details screen, now we can actually have a, a completely different set of controls here for the for the blueprints module uh, that, that, that even supersede those changes. So um, we can change the color of it so it's a little better to uh, uh, appear. Uh, but what you'll find in a lot of cases is many of you may even need a label. You know, with the context of a floor plan and graphics, all of a sudden you have a lot more uh, information to work with. A um, common question I get is, well, if you have customizations for favorites, why would you want additional customizations 
or the blueprint that go beyond that. Um, and the reason for that is the context of the graphics. You know, it's very common for us to call something a living room fan. And so it's very common that might say L L R fan. However, in the context of a blueprint, we know it's in the living room. We can see that. We don't need that information. Right? Matter of fact, the idea that it's a ceiling fan is not even necessarily something that we need. And that's the reason I hid that here. Because among all the different options we have for images, is we actually have a picture of a ceiling fan. So the fact that this was a living a ceiling fan in the living room group is irrelevant now. We don't need that information because we can see it. All right. Um, same thing with the dimmers. Um, we can actually go in and make this look like anything that we want, even going into uh, items that aren't necessarily lights because we do have relay inputs and outputs uh, that may be connected to other things. But you know what? We're going to leave this one as a light bulb, matter of fact, a light bulb group. Um, and we're going to change that, that label and go back to our office light, or office lamp, I should say, as our description. And now, move this guy down to the actual office. And now we have an office lamp. Same thing with the uh, front sconces. You know what? We probably don't need that. It's, it's going to be where it's physically located. Um, but that's actually just a single light anyway. So we'll change this guy that we're going to put it here. And so now we have our three items listed. Um, Blueprints can have multiple screens. There's no limits on the number of screens. If we do add additional screens, um, we have special types. There, there are special types of controls that we can add, be it a static label or clock even, um, that allow us to put a little more useful uh, feed media, media useful information here on the, um, on the screen for the customer. Um, and because we have that extra screen there, we kind of have a way to get to it. Um, so we can actually add in uh, what is a link to that that will to that other screen that will take us to this other screen. You can go rename that too, right? Absolutely. And so we actually rename that by actually going to the screens. That's the reason why it hasn't picked it up yet. Um, so when we switch to the screen, we have a new screen. We simply tap on the name of it, and we can give it a new name. Um, so we should say uh, pool house. Pool house here. Yeah. Right. And so now that we have the word pool house, now all of our labels are going to switch over to those names. How did that? Um, we have the ability to add. Uh, certain types of special types of lists. You know, in our case, it's the favorites list. You know, so you know what? We actually did add a couple things to the favorites list there. So now we actually have a favorites list. That would be a useful thing to have here to have access to these two lights. So maybe what we want to do is add this on here. Our problem is our screen, our floor plan, just really doesn't give us enough room for that. That's OK. We actually have background controls here. In addition, you know, initially we just added an image to, to the background of the screen. We actually also have an edit control. Give us some basic control over this for exactly the type of scenario. So we can actually go into this graphic now. We can actually make it a little bit smaller. So we actually make room for ourselves over on the side for that favorite screen. That seems about right. So we can save those changes now. But uh-oh. What we've done here, we've actually created this kind of gap around around the floor plan. We can actually go back in here and we can actually provide a color, or fact, of any color uh, we want as a background color. So we're going to choose white, so it all looks pretty. So now we've actually shrunk down this floor plan, so we have room for our favorites list. So obviously, we've got to move some of our our labels around here because we move the uh, floor plan. And our floor plan. 
Now, now we have room to put this favorites list over here on the side. Not quite, quite leave myself enough room for the uh, Scots here. That, by the way, would be the fun part of doing the difference. <laughs> I didn't quite leave myself enough room. But we're going to kind of fake her out here for the uh, sake of the sake of the presentation. Uh, moved everything around here. Now we actually have access to the same favorites list that's visible in the portrait version of the iPad and on the iPhone, and it's available here um, on the Blueprint interface. So that the customer has very consistent, consistent type of control across no matter how they're going about controlling their, their UPV installation. It'll always, at least on the favorite screen, it will always look the same across all of their devices. Let's go ahead and call this done for now. We hit done, we go back to a full size screen, and now things control the way you would think it were. You can tap on, this was an on-off control for the sconces, so we have an on and an off command. So we say on, such as an extended on command for this. Uh, this lamp was the office lamp down at the bottom with the dimmer. So when we tap on it, we actually get a dim control where we can actually use our finger and swipe up and down the feather level. And that will, as soon as letting go, your finger lets go of the screen, it will change that, uh, the, the dim level of that. And then the lamp and the ceiling fans actually point at the high-serve controls because it actually um, it actually will, will well, if we were actually controlling a real device, <laughs> if we've actually turned, um, if it actually is on, it will actually animate and turn out of that. Touching on these links to take us to other screens will do exactly that, and it switches it over. We didn't actually set anything up on the second screen, and so that's why there's nothing showing here. Um, and these can be as uh, simple as a floor plan with uh, light bulbs on top of them uh, to um, very complex functionality. Um, jump out of uh, uh, this into a, a more complete uh, a more complete one with eKeypad Pro, where we actually have a UPB installation and cameras and an LPM1. Um, panel involved, you'll notice we have a bunch of feature-rich information here. Everything from camera views that are reaching out and pulling data from a camera for the customer, all the way to um, uh, you know relay controls that are tied to timers, so that was to give tele tell equipment to run things for periods of time, to actually the light that are going through UPB, so we can actually reach out and uh, and do those control of those uh, to thermostats even. Um, but obviously, a much more robust set of functionality, right? That is bringing together uh, information not from just uh, UPB lighting that was installed, but now all of the information uh, that has been part of the customer's installation has all been brought together on one interface. You know, uh, to uh, to make it to make it easier for them to find the information and use that system. Uh, I saw several questions as I was typing through. I'm positive um, out of that. Um, I want to go through this and make sure I get a good answer for everybody. Um, so we was asked if they're using if you're using an LCM one, because you guys are probably all aware you can integrate UPP lighting directly through an M1. Um, and so yeah, but what is the difference between doing that directly? or talking directly to the PIM IP. You do gain the same basic functionality. However, there are some differences. For example, uh, you actually see it on the screen and happen to have it here. Um, for lighting, you can apply through the M1. It supports the concept of a timer built in. So we keep had can offer that functionality through to you. But through the PIM IP, the switches themselves don't natively support the, the same concept of timers, uh, dynamic, these dynamically defined timers. So going through a PIM IP, you would not gain that timer control. However, through a PIM IP, we have significantly better dimming control. Um, 
through the M1, you pretty much have one shot dimming. Where, um, whereas with a uh, UPB installation with a PIM IP, uh, we'll go back here to our our office lamp here. You'll notice that we actually have the concept of dynamic dimming, so we can actually touch and hold. Um, let me remove our passcode here for make things a little simpler. We can actually press and hold the dim thing, um, and press and hold to dim off. So this idea of being able to press and hold the button to dynamically dim a light is not something you would be able to get through an, through an elk. Um, matter of fact, if, if I was put to task to ask the question of the best way to do it, is I would actually have both. I would have the elk with its interface to UPD, and I would have the PIMIP, and I would have the keypad talk to the elk for elk functionality and the PIMIP for UPD functionality because you get the best of both worlds out of that. You'll get the, the most robust lighting control at the same time uh, the elk has the ability to use its rules. Um, somebody has also asked about the alerts um, being set individually or can they be set up globally. Um, no, alerts are set up on a per, uh, a per individual per items um, uh, so that the um, because every individual item can have a different type of uh, type of alert, uh, I, that would be the benefit of, of the being able to set them individually. Um, you know, the uh, UPV input module is monitoring the status of a, a gate. It may want to pop up a message because guess what? When you pop up a, a message on the screen, that message stays until it's acknowledged, as opposed to an audio sound that is only going to alert while um, say that, that gate was open. Um, you know, so it, it, different scenarios oftentimes we found require different um, different styles of alerting for different items. So we have it set up right now to do it individually. Um, and then the question was, is Pro currently only set up for Elk? Uh, uh, yes, but right now the Elk is the best uh, it, it has the best support for alarm you know, under under K Pro, uh, but that's the alarm system we support right now. Um, but we have very robust support for it. Um, we control every aspect of what it offers uh, through the API. We can uh, keypad can has access to it and provides control. Any other questions that uh, anybody has and wants to answer, or Scott, did you have a an area you wanted me to provide a little more control, a little more information on. One of the questions is, is what types of files, formats uh, are used for blueprints and how are they loaded? Um, yeah. One of the, 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 you could basically use JPEGs um, that are stored on the, the phone or the iPad itself, correct? That's correct. Um, it's actually a JPEG or a PNG uh, file format. Um, the sizes are, it depends upon the iPad that you are using, but it's either 1024 by 768 or 2048 by 1636 pixels. But those are the same resolutions as the screen itself. Um, and all you have to do is get those images into the photos. Um, if I go back to the um, I go back to the to the blueprint module here. When when we were in the editing mode and used the background button here, the image section here. This is actually navigating through my my file photos. Everything from my my kid who hits the uh, uh, hit the camera button all the way to the actual floor plan that we you know we actually use for the uh, Use for the samples, but these are not, these are simply images that are stored on the um, in the photo album of the iPad. So you can either email those um, directly to the uh, to the device and save them out of email. Um, if you use, we we do offer an optional service to create these backgrounds. By no means required to use it, but if uh, you know time or 
uh, or resources uh, necessitated. Uh, if we do it, we we we, push, we typically push those backgrounds through this cloud uh, download, where we can download it directly to the uh, to the device. But typically, the easiest way is just to use email in most cases. Well, I think you uh, you all can see um, kind of the power of what uh, what eKeypad can do. Um, and again, this is uh, showing you know the full the full gamut um, of what eKeypad can do. But we've got the eKUPB app, which is uh, fifteen dollars. Uh, the eKeypro app is um, what ninety nine dollars, Jason. That's correct. It is ninety nine dollars. I should also then, note we we have a system where that you can resell the the licenses. You, we you don't have to, and we really don't even recommend that you just send the customers to the iTunes store to buy it. Um, the reality is they're not going to be able to set it up by themselves. Um, so for the same reasons, you don't sell them, send them down to the distributor to buy the switches. You keep at your fault, in our opinion, really the best under that same model. So, um, so yes, EKUPD is fourteen ninety nine. Uh, EK Pro is ninety nine ninety nine. Uh, so fifteen and a hundred. And the uh, Blueprints app is how much? Yeah, right now the Blueprint app we're, we're kind of running it under a special. It's, a, it's actually at nine dollars. Um, but that uh, so it's, it's it's very inexpensive right now. Okay. So, um, uh, and then one of the things that, that uh, you know, there's always the question is, when I back up a configuration, I can email that off-site to myself, save it, whatever. So I could also, if I'm on another job site, kind of have the same rooms and devices. I could actually use that as a template, couldn't I? You could. You could. Um, you could do that, you know, because once you got in the habit, you know, into a rhythm of doing that, that's something that you definitely could do. You'll have to be a little careful on device IDs um, and making sure that you kind of mirror device IDs. Um, otherwise, things get a little bit complicated, especially with Blueprint and Favorite. Um, but I do know of some installers that do exactly that. Well, if they're if they're using the same, you know, if they're cookie cuttering a system. They could use the same yeah. upstart file yeah. and tweak things over and, and go from there. That is exactly true. The guys who are doing that are very consistent on how they set up the systems. You know, okay. if, if there's no, yeah, they're, they're extremely all the way down to, you know, they could tell you just off the top of their head what the device ID of the front sconces are because either the front sconces will use those IDs or if they don't control any front sconces, those IDs are in use. You know, it's a very right. straightforward. Uh, and right. consistent. Um, okay. Definitely possible to do. The, to be honest, the, the primary benefit you'll also find out of uh, the configuration backup is no matter how many devices are involved um, on a job, you should only ever have to set up your keypad one time. Once you've done that one installation, you can go into the configuration backup that I have here and simply make a backup. Obviously, we can uh, encrypt it if we need to. Once we have this backup, we can share it. And this backup will actually now, this copy of the keypad on this device will share this backup on the local Wi-Fi network until we should stop sharing. And any other copy of the keypad can pick it up and restore it. So that uh, you know, in the, in the restore process, the picking up and restoring, it takes all of five to seven seconds of time. Um, Making it you know, almost trivial to move the configuration from one device to the other, and if we move this, even including including a blueprint over to another uh, iPad, all of that information gets gets repopulated. What items are in favorites? How the organization of the favorites? All the configuration around the blueprint all gets the plot redeployed on that new iPad. If they get copied to an iPhone, the all the favorite screen layout and information, it all shows up on my iPhone. Obviously, the blueprint information, which is an iPad-only function, doesn't appear, but it actually is to, can still be, that backup can still be used. So that, uh, you know, I, I, probably some of the larger installations I've done, we were talking about almost 20 devices 
I had iPads in almost every room. But there was the setup and configuration of the keypad happened on one device. And once everybody was happy with how it worked and looked, it then was replicated to the other devices. I mean, that, that all being said, I could have one master one and then put it onto another iPad and delete certain devices off of that that I would add, correct? Absolutely. It's true as well. It's true okay. as well especially if you're using a, a, a pattern of how you do the setup. But you, that will actually be the common case. You know, the example with the sconces, you know, that's part of your standard build-out is a sconces on the front of the house. And if that house doesn't have them, then you would go into favorites and blueprints and delete the sconces because there would be no device for them to control. Right. Okay, so we got a couple questions here. Um, somebody has an M1 app. Uh, how do they upgrade to eKeypad Pro? Yeah, there... Apple does not allow us to do upgrades between applications. And from their perspective, EKM1 and EK Pro are separate. So you would have to um, uh, you would have to have the EK Pro application. Is, is, is this an installer that has the question or an end user? Uh, um, I'm not sure. I would tend to say a, a, a dealer. If, if, there, if you're an installer, um, you should always reach out to us. We have some demonstration versions of eKeypad that we can give you access to uh, so that you can, you can show off all the capabilities of it, um, um, which should negate the need for you to be going out and buying all of the applications, um, just to be able to show them to people. Um, but for an actual end user, they would have to buy the EK Pro application. Right. Okay. Um, getting back to the multiple iPads, so let's say I've got um, – four iPads in my house. They're on different um, Apple accounts. Do I have to purchase the eKeypad Pro per account, or if they're all on the same account, does it just transfer over? That's a great question. <laughs> um, Apple's thrown a huge monkey wrench in that last a couple weeks ago. Um, here's how it works today, and then I'll tell you how it's going to work in the fall. Today, eKeypad uh, Apple requires that it is licensed to the Apple ID. Um, for those of you with Apple devices, that is the account that you, you associate your credit card to. Uh, for those of you that may be uh, Android-based, it's the same concept with the Google's Play Store, where you have um, uh, you have an account with your credit card associated with it. Anyway, so on, on, in Apple's language, the Apple ID is what is licensed for you to that. So any device that's associated with that ID it's automatically licensed for eKeypad. It will not automatically install and configure itself on the other devices. But instead of having to purchase it, you can simply go into the App Store application. We'll see if I can do this, how well this is going to work out on the fly. Um, on the App Store application, on the iPad, you will actually see a purchased button at the very bottom. And that purchased yeah. button will show you all of the applications that have been purchased on that account. And in that list will be eKeypad uh, because it was bought on that account. Okay. Um, okay. Now, if in the job you've got, say, a husband and wife that have two separate Apple IDs, then they will have to purchase two copies of eKeypad because okay. they're using different Apple IDs. Right. And that's okay. how it works today. Apple, a couple weeks ago, threw out a little monkey wrench. In the fall, they are going to support what is called home sharing, in which and pretty much the gist is that here come about October, November, for all effective purposes, eKeypad will become site licensed. So it will always be one license per job. Okay, so great, that, fantastic. And uh, the, the other question we have here is eKeypad apps available on an Android? They are not right now. Um, we strive very hard to make eKeypad you know, a, a very reliable and dependable application because it's supposed to be considered in a tool for installers. You know, so it has to be something that you can stand behind. Um, and cost-effectively support. And to date, that just has 
not really been possible on the Android platform. Um, we are looking to, you know, constantly watching the platform. We have been for the last almost two years. Um, looking for the day where we believe we can provide something that is, has the reliability and dependability that we have, that you will see in the iOS app. Um, but today it's just not possible. Um, so, but as soon as it is, we, we would like to offer that support. Um, okay. So All right. Well, thank you. Um, that being said, um, if anybody's got any further questions, uh, we're here. Um, I would like you will be getting a follow-up email from us um, for a couple of different offers. Um, one of them will be uh, from PCS. You can actually purchase a PMIT at a 30% discount off of your normal pricing. Um, that'll follow up uh, with an email. And um, we also have a Get Started Now kit, which includes um, uh, a seven button keypad, four switches, a PIM IP, or not, excuse me, not a PIM IP, but a, uh, uh, a PIM U, and a phase coupler that uh, kind of what I call is a, an insane discount price. So um, if uh, anybody's got any questions, please type them in now. And uh, otherwise, I think. Uh, You've seen that there's a, some great benefits for both uh, remotely being able to program through the PIM IP as well as uh, having some great control, simple control to uh, very advanced control. Um, so, you know, the thing is that this is being recorded. It should be up on our website, uh, on the PCS website, uh, uh, by early, uh, early next week. Um, and what I will do is kind of show you right on our uh, on our website under uh, support and training. You'll be able to view the different webinars uh, that are, that we've recorded, and uh, but you do you will need to have a uh, an account. So uh, we recommend that you do go to uh, the resources page on pcslighting.com and uh, set up a uh, your own little account and uh, we can go from there. But there are copies here of uh, past uh, courses, simple works, uh, all of basic pulse works, pulse works advanced courses, um, and things along that nature. So uh, you know that's great. Uh, hope you all have had a, a fantastic Friday. Uh, those of you on the East Coast, it's definitely cocktail time, and it shall be for, uh, for us here, too, as well. So um, thank you all again. I hope you have a great day and a fantastic weekend.